anybody else want to come sit up front? I feel very lonely, you know, up here, the empty seats. Come on, ladies, welcome. Where are you all from? Huh? Jalanipo. You're just dropping. Why? What's up with Jalanipo? All this, all this. Oh. It's near that central side, right? All the bad people come from. <laughs> welcome to church. And all of you, welcome in the name of Jesus. You look great. Look at your hairstyle. I want you to know my hairstyle today is a bit messy. I didn't intend for it to be like that. It's World Cup. <laughs> it's not my fault. I slept wrongly. I tried to get it right. didn't work. It doesn't matter. It's all right. I don't care. I'm an old man. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. So tomorrow, France is playing. England got whacked. It was the most pathetic game. Anybody watch the England-Italy game? It was absolutely boring. I slept off. I woke up to pray and all of that. Sat down and watched Italy. So boring. You watch the other games that are being played, man. It's so alive. Fantastic. Anyway. So I don't know why I said all that, but never mind. <laughs> we had a wonderful day yesterday, and it's going to be a great day today. KL Church, I want you to pray. After the service at about 3 o'clock, we're going to be, the, the key leaders and I are going to be viewing a building. We need you to pray. You know, if the Lord opens the door, we, we're just going to look at it. It's a really nice place. Um, it only costs two and a half million. So anybody who's got two and a half million, please let me know. I'll buy the building immediately. But we're going to look at that probably as our future church building. So, amen. So, praise God for that. On, we're going onward, moving forward. So do pray for us. In fact, why don't we just pray right now? Lord, grant us wisdom. Give us the, uh, the favor that we need. Give us favor with business people. Give us favor with Christian, non-Christian, don't matter. But Lord, we ask that you will open the windows of heaven and pour out your blessing upon our church. We would love to buy a nice building. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody in C3KL said, Amen. 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 We own the building in Klang. We want to own another building. When we own buildings, when we own property, we are literally saying we are putting our stake in the ground. We are taking possession and we are not going to be moving around, moving around. Now we've rented buildings. It's not a problem. For years, nothing wrong in renting. But when we begin to buy, we're saying we're putting our stake in the ground. We mean business in seeing people getting saved and so on and so forth. Amen. Why don't you look at your Bibles if you can. If not, just these verses will be flashed up. In Genesis chapter 29, it tells us Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder daughter was Leon. Oh, sorry, Leah. <laughs> I was hoping he'd be here and I wanted to pick where he's working. Okay. And the name of the younger daughter was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate. The King James Version says Leah's eyes were twisted. In other words, she was cross-eyed. Okay? She was not necessarily a pretty girl. The word Leah means gazelle. So she was very skinny, probably had buck tooth, I don't know. And she was cross-eyed. If she looked at you, you didn't know whether she was looking at you or somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, if she cried, tears will roll down the back of her head. But don't laugh at Leah. Don't laugh at Leah. It tells us, that Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful, of form. She was voluptuous, gorgeous. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, obviously. So he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. So Jacob fell in love with Rachel. He committed himself to her for seven years. He worked for nothing for his father-in-law. Now, Jacob was a cheater. He knew how to cheat everybody. And now he's going to get cheated himself. The name Jacob means Cheater, liar, that's what Jacob means. That's why God had to change his name to Israel, which means a prince with God. Follow this story. It's a beautiful love story. But this story also has a lot of personal experiences of Leah, like many of us can identify with her pain, with her journey. It's also a prophetic message, which because out of the four children that she has, out of the four, they are the main four children of the tribe of Israel. The whole nation of Israel, they had 12 tribes. Leah gave birth to four of them. So while it's a personal experience, it's also a prophetic experience that Israel learned about it. But it's also an applicable 
story to all of us who can learn something today. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will take this message and speak to us. I'm going to speak to you. Some of the things I'm going to say are quite strong. Please forgive me if I hurt you. I don't mean to hurt you. I want you to hear the word of God. So I want you to just look at me as a grandfather, which I am physically. I have two and a half. Oh, by the way, my daughter is expecting our third grandson. So three boys she has given to us, which I'm really grateful to God. She said, Papa, you disappointed. You wanted a granddaughter. I said, I got granddaughters in church. I said, my other daughters haven't given I said, I had three daughters and now I've got three grandsons. I'm the wealthiest man on the planet. I tell you, I feel so rich. So now I've got to think big. Three grandsons. I told my wife, I have to buy a boat or something, you know. <laughs> get going. Get going, Grandpa. So I praise the Lord for that. I'm humbled by it. So I'm going to say some things today that might uh, upset you. In fact, I hope it does. Um, and get you out of your, your comfort, sleeping, average lifestyle. Wow. Why do you want to live an average lifestyle when the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in your body? When Jesus is coming back, for accounting days. And I love what you shared just now, Matthias, that your attitude of giving is the most important thing. It's not how much you give. It's your attitude. It's your, your heart. It's the same with marriage. It's the same with serving God. There's going to be a judgment day, of Christ, judgment day of Christ only for Christians. You won't be judged for your sins. I'll talk about it next week. But just as a footnote, I want you to think about that. There is a day of judgment for Christians. Not to be judged for your sins. Never. Your sins are dealt with. It has been judged on the cross. But it's a day of accounting. And it's not what you did. It's how and why you did it that you will be judged. It's that everything that we have done, everything as a Christian, will be tested as by fire. Will it go up in smoke? Or would it be purer than gold, silver, and precious stone? Listen. Every one of us will have to give an account. So in knowledge of that, you want to take your walk with God a little bit more serious. You want to be a little bit more cautious about choices you make in life. <clears throat> now as she, as the Bible tells us here, Leah was the ugly duckling, Rachel was the pretty one, and Jacob worked for seven years. That's how much he was in love. Seven years. Everybody say seven years. Some of you won't work seven days. But anyway, he, he worked seven years, yeah, for, to get his girl. On the wedding night, he goes to sleep with her. I don't know what happened. I don't want to let our imagination go too far. On the wedding night, next morning he gets up, he realizes it's not Rachel, it's Leah. I mean, so anyway, he goes to his father-in-law, Laban, and he says, look, you gave me Leah. I, I asked you for Rachel. And he says, well, it is our custom that the oldest daughter must get married first. So, you know, you, if you, now, if you want Rachel, you have to work another seven years. Okay? <clears throat> While he's working for Rachel, Leah gets pregnant four times. Okay? Now listen to what the Bible said. Leah knew that she was hated. And let's go on and read the verses now. Let's go on to verse 31, I think it is. And the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. She was, the King James Version said she was hated. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. I'm not going to preach much on just this part, but it's a powerful thing that I want you to think about. That when people hate you, when the enemy causes you to be criticized, to be mocked and hated, it does something in the heart of God. It turns God's heart favorably towards you. If only your enemies knew that their hatred and their persecution, I hope you're listening, that all the troubles that you're going through only attracts the favor and the blessing of God, they'll stop messing around with you. Every time I find myself picked on, nasty emails, people criticize, whatever it might be, instead of getting upset, I know in my heart, of course I'm human, I get upset like anybody, but I know in my heart something good is about to happen in my life. And I see this in the scripture. And God, that's the thing I love about God. He loves the underdog. That's the thing about, he loves the leper. He loves the prostitute, the social outcast, the religious outcast, the physical outcast. The people, the Samaritans who were outcasts. 
They were so hated. And he loves these people. That's our God. I love him about that. And I want you to know, if you're going through some kind of trouble and people in the office or in your home area and they're speaking about you and they're gang ganging against you and they've made a plot against you, don't you fret. That's what's going to turn the love and the heart of God and the blessing of God on you. Don't mess with God's people. That's why, that's why our enemy, you know, Satan, is, is, is stupid. He's, he's got brain damage. The Bible said that he bruised the heel of the Messiah, but the Messiah bruised his head. That's what it said in the book of Genesis. So anyone who's got a bruised head has got brain damage. Otherwise, he'll leave you alone. So the next time you're going through some kind of a problem, don't sit down and suck your thumb and cry and feel sorry for yourself. Just realize that the blessing is coming on you in every area. Now, so that's why we don't laugh at people like Leah. She had four sons. Each of the sons she chose to name according to what she was going through. And we can certainly learn something from this. The first son she called was Reuben. Reuben means, I hope Jacob will look at me. I hope he will notice me, see me. That's how she named her children according to, obviously Jacob wasn't paying attention to her. Didn't even look at her. But she gave him a son. She said, I hope now that I've given him a boy, he will turn around and look at me at least once. The cry of a woman who feels that she is deprived of the oxygen of love. And there are people like that. And I want you to know, the question is not whether God sees you. It's how you see yourself. God sees you all the time. He sees you. He sees you as the apple of his eye. He sees you as a person, not like how you see yourself. He would go to a person like Gideon, who is a coward, a wimp, hiding behind a pot shed, hiding behind the wine press where they trample the grapes and make it wine. And God says to him, you are a mighty champion. You are a man of valor. I want you to know, God doesn't see you like your daddy does or your mommy does, even though some of you have very favorable parents, but some of you may not. You may even be having bad thoughts on Father's Day about your dad. He may have hurt you. He may have disappointed you. Maybe he even abandoned you, but God sees you as his child. Jesus called it, told, taught us to call God Father. To call God Father. Some of us have a, a difficulty in translating our relationship to God. We can call him God, the fierce one. Oh, the God of judgment. But Jesus said, no, when you pray, call him Father. And I put my spirit inside of you so that you will resonate, you will understand. So it says, those that are filled with the spirit, call God Abba, Papa, Father, Daddy. That's the kind of relationship. That God wants to have with you. It is good that we take a good look at ourselves. Truthfully. Because really we are wretched. Lost. We are hell bound. We are, we are victims of the devil. We are sin clad. We deserve judgment and punishment. That's how you get saved. You become a Christian not by just going to church. Wearing a cross. God wants you to get on that cross. And identify yourself dead in Christ. It's nice to have a cross. I'm not against it. I wear it. You can tattoo it. You can do whatever you want. But the cross was a symbol of execution and death. It's like wearing the gas chamber <laughs> or the hangman's rope around your, your chain. It was a horrible thing, the cross was. But Jesus, the fact is, Jesus paid that price for us and he died for us. And I often tell, tell Christians, don't just wear the, a cross. Don't just look like you are a Christian. Get on that cross and die and identify. It was because of his love he has saved us. It's because of his love and his resurrection and his blood and his body that was torn for us. That's how you become a Christian. You don't become a Christian just because you go to church and connect with other Christians and think that you become a Christian or change your name. It's when you realize, I see myself lost, I needed a savior. He sees me, and he saved me, and now I'm saved by grace in Christ Jesus. The second child she had, man, this fellow really must have hated her because giving her baby after baby. She calls the boy Simeon, and the boy is now called Simeon, and she 
said, maybe now he will hear me. Maybe Jacob, by giving him the second son, he will now hear me. And again, applying that to ourselves, it's not about God hearing you because even in your faintest whisper, your sigh, he hears your every breath, your cry. The point here is, are you hearing God? Are we sensitive, shut down a little bit, slow down and listen? The Bible says faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? Philosophy, what people said, hearing gossip, hearing what the world is saying about how life should be. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is what the Bible says, and I didn't put it in the notes, but that's okay. You can flash it up once you get it. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Two people can be sitting in the church. One will hear the word of God, mix it with faith, and get result. Two people can hear the word of God. Another person will hear the word of God and go, la di da big deal, God wants to bless, but I've never seen him bless, and go into all that garbage, and it doesn't work. Two people can sit in the church, hear the word of God. Somebody will, one of them will come up and say, Pastor, I was really blessed today. It was a great word of God. Another guy will just say, ah, I didn't get anything today. The issue is not the gospel. The issue is what you and how you respond to the gospel. And the Bible says many of them, to, the word didn't work for them. The word which they heard did not profit them. No, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. When you hear the word of God, you need to mix it with faith. James chapter 1 verse 20, 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness. When are you going to stop blaming people for your lifestyle? For the fruit of your life, maybe it's horrible as it, it might be, and you're, you're sad, and you're angry, and you want your lifestyle to change. When are you going to take the whole responsibility for your life? When are you going to stop blaming your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your parents who were divorced or left you alone, and you grew up in an orphanage, and you never had the right love? And when are you going to just stop all of that and say, I'm responsible for my life? I am solely the man that's responsible for my life and what happens in my life. Because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a new day. You sing a new song. You have a new heart. You have a new hope. How does that happen? When you hear the word of God, and this is what it says, who receive with meekness the implanted word or the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. You're not happy about what's happening in your soul? Stop blaming everybody. It's the church, it's the Sunday school, it's the, the, my boss, it's the government, it's the UMNO, it's the, you know, whatever. It, it, they're the ones that are making me miserable. When are you going to take responsibility? Because if you hear the word and not just hear it and spend time with it and allow it to be engrafted. Engrafted is like what you take a branch and you engraft it in another tree so that it can have the multiple fruits or all that sort of thing. But it's got to be stuck there long enough. And when you take the word of God into your heart, it's not about God hearing you. Are you hearing God? Then comes the third son. His name is Levi. Levi simply means, I wish, now that I've given him a third son, that he will be joined with me. You know, I've given and given and given. I, I wish I'd have some reciprocity. I, I wish he'll pay a bit of attention. Maybe we could, you know, just kind of talk and, and, and just hold hands and go out for a romantic stroll. I, I've been giving him all my love. I gave him as a wife. And I know I'm hated, but I wish I can get some reciprocity. Levi means connected. Levi means joined. Levi means committed. Do you know, listen to me, it might shock you, that even God expects reciprocity. Okay? The Bible tells us very clearly in James chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. You draw, you take one step and watch me. As long as you stand off, I'll stand off. 
draw near to me. So she's going through this experience. Now, after these three boys, she gets the fourth boy, and his name is Judah. And she simply says, you know, I'm not going to be looking for my husband anymore or anybody else to approve me. She says, now I will praise the Lord. Judah means praise. She says, I'm not going to be whining. I'm not going to be looking for my husband or my father or whoever to like me. It's not about them liking me. Now I will praise. How many of you know that Jesus, one of his titles is he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah is the most powerful thing that we can ever experience. Judah means praise. How many of you know what it is to really praise God with all your heart? The Bible tells us and encourages us, shout to the Lord, clap your hands, make a joyful noise. God is not nervous when you make noise, he, he wakes up from his sleep. God loves it when we are actively praising him. Peter and John, uh, sorry, Paul and Silas were, were in prison. And what did they do? They could have sat there with all the bruises on their body. And they could have said, why us? Why us? You know, we shouldn't have done this. Shouldn't have preached the gospel. In the midnight, they began to sing praises to God. And God began to just love their praises. And as someone said, the heavens is the Lord and the earth is his footstool. You know what a footstool is? Where you put your foot on. And those guys are praising God. God's going like, yeah, and he tapped his foot. And there was an earthquake. <laughs> it was the first jailhouse rock before Elvis came along. Then all the chains were gone. The Bible gives us so many scriptures. Listen to this. This is one of my favorite. When I go into trouble and I find myself, I cannot pray anymore. I, 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 I can't read scriptures anymore. You know, I just walk the floor and I just praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And this is what it says in Psalms. When I was a young pastor, when I met with an accident that could have killed me, I should have been killed, but I had to go back to my little church in typing and preach with broken teeth and smashed lips and cuts all over from a motorbike accident. And I didn't have a guest speaker. Then I would hold my handkerchief like that because all my face was cut and all bleeding. And I had to preach like this so that the teeth and the stone that was still coming out of my mouth and the blood, and I would squeeze it into a cup and then continue because I didn't have any assistant pastor, guest speaker. That was years and years ago. Isn't it wonderful I'm still so handsome? <laughs> Thank you, Donnie. I love you too, bro. I was just dating my girlfriend, Stella, who is my wife. I thought, gone, I finished. She's not going to marry this fellow. Lips are all torn, teeth. I look really awful. And I remember there are times I would walk up and down. And I said, God, I just don't, I'm just so young. I'm just pioneering. We were just boyfriend, girlfriend. She was in PJ studying. I was in typing. And I would just walk the floor. And that was one of the many times I've done that. I've been through so many kinds of problems. People had come to burn our church in Klang when we started it. They poured petrol inside under the door and lit it. I was taken by the police. I was called by the special branch. So many things. And there were times where I just couldn't pray. I just felt a heaviness inside of me that I just had to praise God. So I just walked the floor and praised God. And this scripture in Psalm 68 verse 1 and 3 had been like the clarion call of my prayer life. And this is what he says, let God arise. This was the words of Moses when he would move, of David wrote it in a psalm. When he would move Israel from camp A to camp B, every time they moved, they would pick up the ark and Aaron and Moses would shout aloud, let God arise. Like God is rising, get up. If you follow him, there'll be perpetual safety. The scorpions and the snakes will not get you. The enemies will not come and rob you and kill your family in the night. You follow God. Let God arise. And all his enemies began to scatter. I love that. Because, you know, God came by a pillar of fire in the night to give them central heating in the cold desert. And he would come in a pillar of cloud in the day to give them air conditioning in the heat. So imagine if you were outside the presence of God, you'd be freezing or you'd be, you'd be burnt to death or snakes and what had you. Let God arise. So I would always begin to praise God 
God, arise. Let my enemies be scattered. Let those that, that hate you flee before you. As smoke is driven away, that's what praise does. Like smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, let the wicked perish at the presence of the Lord. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice exceedingly before God. So let them rejoice exceedingly. That's praise. Here's another verse. Psalms 149, verse 6 to 9. Let the high praises of God be where? Come on, read it. Where's the high praises of God be where? In your mouth. And the two-edged sword where? In your hand. Now Christians, don't reverse it. Don't let the two-edged sword be in your mouth where you're quoting scriptures and other people. You are like this, you are like that. No, 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 balance. Let high praises of God be in your mouth. Two-edged sword, use it and quote the word of God. High praises. That means there are low praises? Yeah. When you're half-heartedly praising God, it's low praises, a stench. But high praises of God, what happened? And a two-edged sword in your hand. To execute vengeance on nations, punishments on people, bind kings with chains. He's all talking about the demonic world. You want to get the demonic world? Don't be fighting and binding and binding and loosing and binding. You talk to some people who are doing what they call spiritual warfare. They are more bound up than anything else. They, they, they are really like, where's the devil, where's the devil? He says, when you begin to do the high praises of God, they begin to get dealt with in the name of Jesus. Now, how many of you want to see the effect of the praising, the honor, the blessing? He says, this honor have all his saints, praise the Lord. This is the honor God has given to you. How many of you want to see demons driven from your situation? How many of you want to see the enemy rebuked over your situation and God coming? Can you see your hand? Put your hand. I've got my hand up. I want to see miracles happen. But here's how it works. And this is actually my main point. I took a long time to say all that to say this. Before you can have Judah, you've got to have Levi. You've got to know what it is to be connected, not only with God, but with the things of God. Many people want the celebration of the wedding. They don't understand that once it is finished, you get down to the commitment of marriage. We all like the hand-holding, the petting, the kissing. We, there are no children here. We love sex and it's full. I mean, God cre created sex. Some, some people pretend like, oh, such a bad word. No, no, it's a good word because God made it. Everything that God made is good. The devil didn't make sex. God made sex. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? amen. You can stop blushing now, um, Carl. It's all right. Yes. We're all adults. We can talk about things like that. I know your hands were going really fast <laughs> on your iPad. Like <laughs> all right. It's a good thing. It's a God thing. Okay, the enemy is a pervert, just like music. God made music. Everything on this planet, God made. The devil didn't make anything, so don't you go around giving the devil credit. God made it, and it's good. But if you want all the niceties of marriage, but you won't pay the bills, you won't be a husband, you won't be a wife. Well, I've got my indiv individuality. Of course you do, my dear. But when you stepped into that marriage, you said that for better or for worse, in sickness or in health. Now, I'm not knocking anybody. You know, the Bible tells us that, uh, uh, that once God put two people together. Now, you may have had a marriage in the past. That's finished. It's gone. But today, many of you might be wanting to think about entering into a relationship, a marriage. And as your pastor, I'm going to tell you something. If you failed in your previous relationships, that's fine. Let's learn for, from some mistakes. Don't be like Adele. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. Why do you want to find someone like him? You already broke up with him. Find someone different. But you all love that song. Some of you had your hands lifted as she sang. <laughs> you want a new thing, amen. Yeah. In any good relationship, be it your work, your studies, there has got to be this thing called commitment. 
Which boss will hire you if you're just there for payday? You think you only want money. He also wants money. He's your boss. He didn't become your boss because he was lazy. He had to put in the hours. But there are so many people who have a mentality. They want the suit. They want the tie. They want all the things that relate to success. But they won't roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. They won't spend the extra hour. They're looking for payday and holiday and I'm out of here. But there is, a there is a reciprocity that must come in life. You know, it's the same with marriage. You need to completely commit yourself to this situation. Otherwise, please don't get married. There is enough of heartache in our world. Kids are being born. They didn't ask to be born. Many of us want to have kids, but we don't want to be parents. Do you know what it is to be a dad, to be a parent? That means you say to your kid, I'm committed to my kid. You can poo-poo on me, you can vomit on me, you can pee-pee on me. You are supposed to. <laughs> on me, I'm your dad. I have a responsibility over you. I love you. Okay, I'm not doing you any favors. This is my life. But when I grow up and when I grow old, and when I need someone to hold my hand and walk and to cross the road and I'm slow to answer your question, don't get irritated with me. You're not doing me any favor as my son or as my daughter. You're doing it as a reciprocity. I financed you. I sent you to college. I covered your tracks. Dads, please understand. When our kids are good, they're our kids. When they're bad, they're still our kids. I get some men, Christian men, saying, oh, I feel very embarrassed at what my daughter... I say to them, guys, he may, be, he may be like the prodigal son. He may have taken your inheritance, shamed your name. He's still your son. He may have gone to jail. He's still your son. He may have got drunk and got on drugs and ended up in a pigsty with prostitutes. You keep that door open. You leave that chair there. He is still your son. Oh, he's embarrassed me. Shame to the family. I've cut it. If she comes home pregnant, she's still your daughter. If she comes home with a, with a man of another faith, we don't approve of it, but nevertheless, she is forever your girl, your daughter. Now, if we have that kind of commitment in our world today, it will be a much better place. You are my son. Good, bad, in between. So you became a Muslim. That's all right. I won't serve you for. You still come home. You still come home. I hear Christian fathers saying, oh, so embarrassed, shame. I said to one man, I actually said it to his face. You don't blame your children. They model after you. You and your wife are super critical, always criticizing other people what goes on in church. Your children were very small. They were wide-eyed, but they were listening. It went into their spirit. When they're small, they cannot say anything. When they grow up, they'll just say, I hate church. I'm out of there. So don't come, oh, pray for my children. You modeled after them, for them to follow. So you take responsibility. I would say, I, I can say that, you know, because I'm old. Yeah. Older than most of these fellas blaming the children. Oh, my daughter, may she never come back to your home. I said, she's always welcome in my home because you're an irresponsible idiot. That's what you are. You won't take the responsibility to blame yourself that she ran away. And she had to go find a boy somewhere. The girl's first boyfriend is always their dad. Did you know that? You didn't know that. I've got three daughters. Their first sweetheart who gave them a kiss on the lip was their papa. So if your daughter ran away from home, why the church cannot do anything about it? You drove her from, you go find her. You drove her. Don't ask the youth pastor to go. And the church, oh, pastor, you're talking. No, you drove your daughter into that. You take responsibility. You repent and you change. I, know, I told you I, I, it's going to be like quite tough this message. Eh? Not easy. Jesus said it like this. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 to 17 Jesus said I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot but then because you are lukewarm and therefore neither hot or cold I will vomit you out of my mouth. Oh my God how can Jesus speak like that? Isn't he full of love? Yes he's full of love and he's saying to you I wish that you were hot or cold. If you're cold I can warm you up. If you're hot, I'll just direct your fire properly, channel the fire. 
but you are lukewarm. He said, you are a stench. Because you say, I'm rich, I have wealth, and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God sees your heart. So, here's the challenge today. You want Judah. You want the lion of the tribe of Judah. You want the power and the praise and the enemy under your feet. Maybe you have been a Reuben and you've had a Reuben experience. You know that God looks on you favorably. Every time you come to church, God, you know that God doesn't judge you. He doesn't condemn you. You had a Reuben experience. You were in love with Jesus. You had a Simeon experience. You hear the word of God. You hear the word of God. You hear the word of God. Now God is saying to you, where is the Levi experience? You're neither hot, you're neither cold, you are lukewarm. I can have 10 jobs, but I don't think I'll do well in any of them. I take my commitment very seriously. I can have four wives. I'm just saying, don't tell my wife I said that. But, but if I'm ever going to be a good man, someone once said a good lover loves one woman for the rest of his life. One woman. That's a good lover. Any dog can go and <laughs> bonk around, you know. But a good lover keeps that woman happy for the rest of her life. I take my commitment seriously. So I don't go to 10 different ministries. I, I take what we're doing here very seriously. So I commit myself. I prepare my messages. I pray hard for this church. Now we run several churches. I get invitations all around the world, every time. But it's in Australia. But I take my church, my home church, my family, which is you guys, seriously. So my commitment is very serious when it comes to my church. I'm a guest speaker when I go to other churches. Like me, don't like me, that's okay. I'm a guest, I'm invited. I go there, preach. Everybody loves me, I tell you. I'm so lovable. They love me. I just spoke at a camp. Oh, they stood and took photos. There were over a hundred, over a couple of hundred people stood and took photos and, and liked me on Facebook. And oh, they wouldn't let me out of their sight. They thought I was wonderful because I was just with them for four days. Preached my best messages. They loved me. Everything. My dressing, my wife, my hairstyle, praying for them, how accurate it was, all of that. But I'm not committed to that church. I'm committed to this church, and none of you like me. <laughs> Donnie almost fell off there. <laughs> and I don't care. I don't care if a hundred people write to me, oh, can we be your friend? On I like so many people, but I take my friendship seriously. I take my commitment to friendship seriously, because when I become your friend, I will never take anything from you that I will not give twice as much back because I really take my friendship seriously. I like a lot of people. I like to have a lot of friends. But when I take someone as a friend, that means I come into your life to enrich you. I will cover your back. Even when you're in problems, I'm there for you. I'll pray for you. I'll support you physically. I'll give towards you financially. I'll stand by you. When your marriage falls apart, emotionally, I'll be there for you. When your children are having problems. When I come into a friendship, I take that relationship seriously. I commit myself. I make sure that your life is richer, never poorer. And when I leave that friendship and go to other places or travel away to another country, you will miss me. That's how I treat relationships. Some people, you know, they have the nerve to call me up. Now, since I had a handphone, my number hasn't changed. So that's what, 20 some years, I think. <laughs> or maybe more. My number hasn't changed. So I pastored churches in many different places and I've given away my a mobile number to everybody. So people know my mobile number. They want to contact me, they can. The other day, a lady calls me. And this happened not once, but different people. The other day, she called me. Really irritated me. Calls me up and she says, hello, Pastor Joe. I said, hello, because I didn't recognize the number. I don't know who she was. Sometimes I don't answer the phone because I don't know what this number and who these people are. Because always, you know, some, so anyway, I was relaxing. I answered, said, hello. She said, hello, Pastor Joe. I said, hello, speaking. You remember me, ah? 
I said, I'm sorry, I'm not good with uh, voices and uh, who's this? You cannot, you don't remember me, huh? <laughs> I said, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I give you three guesses. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. So I said, I'm really not good at guessing and all that sort of stuff. You know, a long time ago, this was like 20 some years ago, my daughter was very, very sick and you prayed for her, she was dying. The doctor said, finish. She was in the ICU, you came, you prayed. And then you put your handkerchief on her and left it there and she was healed, you know. I said, oh, okay, okay. Then she tells me her name. I said, oh, all right, how, how's everybody? That's fine. You know, now my daughter and all of us are moved you know, towards Klang, very near church. And uh, now my granddaughter is, uh, is uh, sick. And uh, can you come now and pray for my granddaughter? Uh, I said, I, I can't. I said, uh, it's Saturday, why don't you come tomorrow to church on Sunday? I said, I'll pray for you over the phone. No, 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 you come now. 20 some years, eh? never seen, eh? never seen. I said, I can't. I said, you come to church. You must come to church eh? tomorrow, uh, Sunday. Eh? What time? 10.30. 10.30. Eh? I see life, like I'm free, and I'll come. <laughs> the nerve, they want the miracles of God. No reciprocity. There are people in this church who take their ministry seriously. They pray every Thursday. They come early to the church and practice the, the worship team to get the atmosphere ready. There are some of you who are by far more talented than many of the leaders that are in the church. The only difference is you are sitting on your talent. They are working in commitment to the call of God. They take their commitment seriously. I'm going to ask you a very bold question. When are you going to Take something in your life more seriously. When are you ever going to, you're taking a course, finish it, you're going to work, do well. If you're married, take responsibility. It's not 50, 50, it's 100 and 100. If you're a parent, raise the children up. If you're a church person, when are you? When is there ever going to come a time eh, where you are going to throw yourself completely into what you really believe? Otherwise, get out of there. When? When are you going to throw yourself, when are you going to have a Levi experience before you have the Judah experience? When are you going to throw yourself to one thing in life, in the kingdom of God, that you're going to throw yourself completely? I want you to know your relationship with Jesus Christ is not a cheap relationship. You know, when you go shopping, as I always do, we look for bargain sales, you know. Cheap sales, anything that's cheap, so that we can save. But we all really know that the real expensive stuff never go on sale. You never walk to a Rolls Royce shop and say, can any discounts are here in Rolls Royce? They'll tell you either you got money or you don't have money. Okay, they ne there's no discounts in Rolls Royce. So what am I saying? The blood of Jesus is more powerful than any Rolls Royce. There's no discount in a relationship with God. When I'm free, I come. When I'm not free, I don't come. There's no discount. Don't you dare ask for discounts in marriages, in your marriage, in your church relationship, your connect group. Don't say, Asila, how? 50-50, you know. If I like what's going on, I commit. If I don't like, then get out of there immediately. I'll tell people, get out. Don't waste our time. Don't waste our time. Don't waste my time, don't waste yours. I won't change my handphone number for anybody. So you can call. People call me, write emails to me, all kinds of things. But I say to people, if you want anything to last in your life, don't ask for discount. Don't get cheap. Don't get cheap. Pay the price. Don't just say, bro, we are connected, bro. We are connected, bro. We hear people like that. <laughs> love you, bro. After a few drinks, you love everybody very much. <laughs> love you, bro. Bro, see you, bro. Take care, bro. Love you, bro. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, and then we'll close. Four areas to live a committed life. Four areas we must really commit ourselves completely. Number one, commit yourself to God completely. He owns everything. He only lends you this life for a little while. Don't act like you created what you have. He's so kind. He's so benevolent. He says, I just want 10 cents out of that one dollar. That's all. And that we fight over with God. He said, you can keep 90 cents. 10 cents. 
I want you to think like that. So if I make 10,000, that's a thousand I give you. Cut it down, it's 10 cents out of one dollar, 10%. That also we struggle. He owns everything. He owns everything. If, if I took the offering seriously, and when they say, you owe God everything, you need to give God your all, I would have to walk home naked today. Because my suit, my clothes, my car, my house, that's how I live. Everything, my wife, my kids, the life that I have, the air that I'm breathing, everything he owns. I owe him everything. How could I commit myself so, so cheaply? How can I ask God for a bargain? Okay. Your, your amen is really deafening. It's just, <laughs> your, your, your feedback is like, wow. I, phew, I'm overwhelmed with your enthusiasm. The second area you need to really commit, and I'm serious, I spend a lot of time with that. That doesn't mean I have a perfect family. I, my children know me better. My wife knows me, of course, the best. I mess up all the time. I'm not trying to be humble. That's really me. I failed. I made mistakes. I've lost my temper. I've said things that I'm sh ashamed of. And, uh, you know, I failed my children by being a bad testimony many times, by not falling through on my word, my commitment, but I've always learned to be big enough. And that's the hardest part, when a man of God has to say, I'm sorry. And I've said, I've eaten, I put on weight just by eating humble pie. I've eaten so many humble pies <laughs> because I take that commitment to my girls seriously. I take my commitment to my daughters very seriously to love and to honor we say this in a marriage to trust and to serve in sickness and in health for richer or for poorer in adversity and prosperity as long as we both shall live we stand at the altar and we say that with google eyes and as long as we both shall live mm -hmm. <laughs> and the pastor is looking at both of you saying that God is looking. That's why I say, if you can't follow through on that, please, it's, look, honestly, it's better to be single than to enter into a relationship that you're going to mess everyone around you and hurt them. Better to be single. You can date whoever you want, shop whenever you want, spend all your money. They won't ask you, why, why you buy, why, why for you bought that? <laughs> like this woman who went shopping, you know, husband said, please, sir. Huh? Promise me one thing, when you go shopping, don't buy another new dress. She said, I promise no more. I will not buy any more new dress today. I know I have so many I haven't even used. She goes shopping, she comes home with a brand new dress. The husband said, you promised me. She said, but darling, I couldn't help it as I was putting on the dress. The devil stood there and he said, you look gorgeous, you look beautiful. <laughs> he made me buy this dress, darling. She said, but I told you, you must rebuke the devil. She said, I did. I rebuked him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. And he went behind me and he says, baby, you look even greater from the back. <laughs> yeah. The third area of commitment that you need to commit is to your church. This church, like all churches, have been bought with a price, you're not your own. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's God's temple. Well, we got pillars, lights. Some people say, why are there no cross in your church? I'll say, you, you want a cross? Might, then we can also put gas chamber up there. <laughs> yeah? Put electric chair in the needle. Okay, you want a sign of execution. We preach the blood of Jesus. We preach his death, that he died for us, and his resurrection. So we are not into that. So really the church of Jesus Christ is you people. It's us. And I really thank many of you who open your homes, you have started connect groups and you are involved in it. Now here's my point. For years people have paid the price, given their tithe, sacrificed, you know, stood up together. I, I can tell you of people who, who 
realize that, you know, there was a time when we pioneered uh, our church in Subang and, and uh, a lot of our people went over there and the financial situation of our church dipped. Our expenses were still up there because we were covering our car park churches. They depended on us 100% for their rental, their salaries, electricity, everything, the repair of the vans, everything. So our expenses were up there, but the finances dipped. People in our church stood forward and gave out of their, their lack. They, 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 they gave. I remember my wife and I were just so, you know, we were just so challenged by the situation. We refused to take salaries. We cut down. We bled. We gave up buildings. We didn't want to rent any offices. We bled. We dug deep. We, we adjusted our finances. We sold our other house and we put money in so that the church could continue. We never went into debt. But in two years, because people stood up together, they were saying, look, you, many of you have done great for the church. This is our time. When are you ever going to say, I thank the Lord for the leaders, I thank the Lord for setting up the place. This is my time. I'm stepping up. I want to have a go. I want to know what it is. I want to know what it is. It is my time. Not just come and bum around and ask everybody to pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for my business. Pray for my family. Pray I'll prosper. Pray I won't meet with accident. Hallelujah in Jesus' name. Okay, see you next month. When are you going to say it's my time? I'm going to commit myself. Tell me, when can I join a connect group? How can I help somebody? Oh, don't ask them. Don't trouble them. They are very busy. You think we all are not busy? You think only you have got 24 hours a day and 7 days a week? We all got 50 hours a day. You think we don't have challenges and needs to, to, to take care of and parties we want to go and places we've been invited that we had to say no because at this point of time, the church needs us to be around. So we cut holidays, we cut preaching engagements and all of that so that we just want to hang around with our people and love them and tell them, don't be afraid. We're still here. Nobody is going to move us. We're going to move forward in Jesus' name. Now, when are some of you going to be man and woman enough to stand up and say, this is the house of God. I'm going to be standing with you. Come on, let's do something. Let's do something. When are you going to grow up? You're not getting younger, you know. Hello, listen to me. I promise you, you might look and think you're getting younger. You're not getting younger. You're getting older and you're going to die soon. You're going to enter into the presence of God. Look, don't be afraid of death. Amen. God's got that covered. It's nothing for us. It's a translation. Absent from here, present the Lord. Absent from the body, present the Lord. Faster than a twinkling of an eye. But you're going to enter into his presence where he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've done well. You threw yourself into that. And here's your reward. Don't you think that some people rightfully can get tired? And they'll say, looks like my investment in these guys does not warrant a return. What, what for? They're not thankful. Talking to them for so long, counseling them, praying for them, doing their weddings, doing their marriages, burying their parents who never even came to church. Did all of that. Some people might just say, well, what for? It's not warranted. What's the, what's the reciprocity in this? Wasting time. So that's why the Bible tells us, Paul writes, don't be weary in well-doing. You will reap in due season. If you faint not, don't faint, don't give up. This is not the time to give up. So you visited people, you opened your home, you prepared the, the connect group area, you, you, you did the coffee thing, you, you did the, the, the steak thing, you, you, you did the barbecue thing, and, and you waited for them to come. And there's no reciprocity. Don't get weary. Don't get weary. It will come in due season. And that's why I keep encouraging every one of you. So number one, commit yourself to God. Number two, commit yourself to your family. Number three, commit yourself to church. And number four, commit yourself to your work. Because God wants you to have a successful lifestyle out there. That is the best marketplace that God, God gave you a job. Okay, not for you to go around trying to win everybody to the Lord. But that you will begin to enjoy your work like a Christian should. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 29 about this situation, verse 20. It says in Genesis chapter 29, verse 20. 
It says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days. How many of you noticed that this year has gone by so fast? Wait, one moment we were in Christmas, next moment, boom, we are almost in July. Whoo! Some of you didn't even take down the Christmas tree yet, and you got to put it up again. <laughs> you know? Why? Because you were enjoying yourself in God. You were busy and ministering and you know, having a great time and we've got so many fathers here and we had babies added to the church and my word, I, I look at, wow, it's gone by Zoom. And uh, I'm going to be a granddad again by the end of this year. I'm traveling to England, I'm speaking there. I'm going to different parts of the world and things are happening so fast. And because we're enjoying ourselves, we're in love with God. When you go to work, I mean, you're spending nine hours, eight, nine hours at work. You better learn to find something you can enjoy. Otherwise, imagine nine hours, ten hours a day, and you are ulcerating. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. You are the most stupid person that's on the planet, honestly. You better love it. Amen. I love my job. I love people. I love to study the word and prepare and prepare and pray and think, what can I feed these people this Sunday? What can I bless these people from the word of God that they can go home out of this church and the thing is buzzing in their heart. God is saying, I love you. You're the apple of my eye. And when they go through tough times, God says, I care. Like the disciples face the storm and they say, Lord, don't you care? And of course he cares. He cares whenever you go through a storm. So four areas, if you can commit, those, commit yourself to those things, I'm telling you, you will fly. You will open opportunities and blessings that will come upon your life, you cannot even imagine the great things, the good things that God is going to be doing for you. Praise the Lord. Do you receive that word? What is your name? Rosalind. What a beautiful name. And you're a beautiful girl. How old are you? 12? 19? Form, finish your forms. College. What's your name? Caroline. Caroline. Carolyn, Carolyn. Carolyn, Carolyn, through the snow, Christmas bells are ringing. And uh, are you all sisters or what? All three sisters. And what is your name, sweetheart? Fideli. 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 Sorry? Fideling. Fideling. Fideli. Are you the youngest? Eldest. You're the eldest. But you've got such a baby face, <laughs> such gorgeous eyes. Wonderful. Let's stand together. How many of you just want to worship? Listen, when you're going to praise God, as I say, in all your life, you can choose to either do it with all your heart and choose never to do it half-heartedly. Praise God with all your heart. a wonderful work because uh, God will break us down. God will remind us of the things that we need to work on. So just allow Him to minister to you now. Just to speak to you personally. To tell you what is uh, your special area that He wants you to kind of concentrate on. Lord, I want a closer relationship with you. I want to be able to bring that love into my family and to commit myself fully. And then for my church to know that I am dependable, Lord. That the people of God can count on me, Jesus. Because you put me here for a reason, Father.
that my bosses see that I have a heart to serve Father. And they're wondering why I'm, I'm going through my paperwork with a big smile on my face, although I have tight deadlines. Because the joy of the Lord will overflow into my work.
this church. Jesus be the center of our church. And every knee will bow. And every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Sing Jesus. 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 Oh, Jesus. understand the language of commitment I pray that today the Holy Spirit will speak to you and help you step up in understanding what it is to be a committed daughter or a son to your parents parents to your children husbands with wives wives with husbands committing yourself to your church to your place of influence your marketplace your work that you will live for once, give yourself completely. So Heavenly Fathers, we stand here today on this beautiful day. We stand by faith upon your word. We want to take your word and mix it with faith to see it produce results in our life. That we will be word people, orientated by the word of God, trained and disciplined. I pray that this church will be a a group of committed, not lukewarm, not half-baked, average, but committed people. That they will be the kind of people that will completely take their life and lay it at the cross and say, it's all yours. And I pray that you will bless each and every one as they leave this place, fellowshipping with one another. May the favor and the blessing of God follow them all the way home. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. Come on. I'm leaving my past behind I'm setting my heart and mind on you Jesus I'm my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good It's good Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Today is the day you have made. 